uh, from Matthew chapter 6, and there uh, the Bible tells us of the Lord's Prayer. And it's a beautiful study, and for me it's been rich and rewarding and meaningful already. And so I am so excited to share it with you. The other piece of the summer of prayer is a request from your pastor. I'm asking that hundreds of you join me in making a commitment to pray for our church every day. Now, here's the way you can get your daily prayer request. Now, I know there's an email that goes out with prayer requests that are mostly about people who are sick and and have needs uh, uh, related to illness. That's very important. Please continue to do that. But I want you to know that this is separate from that. This is hopefully in addition to that. For example, I want you to pray for me as I prepare a series of messages called Hard Questions that's coming in the fall. I want you to pray for our other staff members as they prepare for big events that are coming in the fall and at Christmas. And we have prepared a prayer request for every day. And so those prayer requests will be delivered to you in two ways. First, we'd like you to get the HBC app. If you have a smartphone and you don't have the HBC app, we ask you to get that, and then it will show up as a notification every day. You don't need to do anything after you sign up for the app. It'll just show up. On the bottom of your printed bulletin, there are instructions how to get that app on your phone. Now, if you prefer not to use that approach and would rather have a paper copy, at the Information Center today, there are paper copies of the first month of prayer requests, and you can take that paper and use it as your daily prayer guide. So two pieces to summer of prayer. When you hear the term summer of prayer, first of all, know that I'm going to be teaching from the Lord's Prayer through the month of August, from now through the month of August. And then second, please know that we're asking you to pray for us every day. And our goal, of course, is that HBC would become a wonderful, warm, loving, praying church. And I know you already are, but I believe the Lord is using this to take our prayer ministry to the next level, and I'm very, very excited about it. Have you ever heard someone pray uh, and, and you thought or maybe even said, wow, I wish I could pray like that? Do you ever think of some people as prayer ninjas and you're a prayer wimp? <laughs> or maybe they're prayer warriors and you're not. I think all of us have had some of those, some of those thoughts at times. And that's really what's been on my heart this week as I've prepared this message. So, so let me ask you a question. In those times when you pray, for example, you come to the Lord and you're just pouring your heart out for a loved one that's hurting for whatever reason, you're just coming to the Lord for that. Or maybe you just come to the Lord on your knees because the word that came in that phone call from the doctor was just terrible news. Or it's that moment when you're just not sure which direction to take, you're not sure what road you should take or what choice you should make, and you really need direction from the Lord. And so you come to the Lord and you just seek His will. God, what would you have me do? God, what's the right thing for me to do in this tough situation? Now, when you come to the Lord in times like that and you just pour your heart out to the Lord, do you think that the Lord kind of stands back and says, well, you know, that was a pretty good prayer. I'd really rather have some bigger theological words in there. And, you know, I really wish that it had a little more emotional intensity. You think God would hold up a sign and say, I'm going to give her a 7 out of 10 on that, uh, on that prayer. No, no, it's not like that at all. And I, and I think Satan uses thoughts about our own inferiority in prayer to keep us from approaching the Lord in prayer. That's why I have looked forward with great anticipation and great excitement to sharing this, these messages with you. In fact, there was a time when the disciples said to the Lord, Jesus, teach us to pray. And Jesus said, okay, when you pray, pray like this. And that's what we're going to be studying for the rest of the summer. Isn't that an exciting thought? Go with me back to the days of World War II. Near the end of World War II, there was a young pastor, and his name was Helmut Thielich. Thielich was pastor in Stuttgart, Germany. And Thielich pastored during the, the entire war. He preached the gospel, and he was a gospel preacher. He preached the gospel for the entire season of the war, those many, many years. But as 
The time came when it was within weeks of when the Third Reich would fall, and everyone could see it. The Russian army was advancing from the east. The Allies were making slow but steady progress from the west. There was no question that Germany was going to fall. And in those times, people were losing all hope. Telix says there was death and destruction everywhere. And in those scenes of death and destruction, Telix preached a series of sermons. And the series he preached was on the Lord's Prayer. Does that seem like a, a kind of a surprising uh, prayer subject for that season in the life of his people? Would you think maybe the Lord would have him to preach how to find hope in a hopeless situation or what to do when your world falls apart? He chose to preach the Lord's Prayer. And it was in that moment when there was no hope. He spoke of the fear and desperation on the faces of his hearers when he wrote about this years later. And Telix said this. He said there were moments uh, almost continually they lived in the torment of doubt and despair. But Telix said the Lord's Prayer was able to contain it all. I think that's true for us today. Whatever we're experiencing or going through, the Lord's Prayer is able to contain it all. The Lord's Prayer is big enough and sufficient and comprehensive enough and simple enough that it contains all of what you're experiencing in your life. And I know it's a ton. I know you're experiencing some incredible things. You know, um, it is not our custom to very often repeat the Lord's Prayer together. And it is out of an abundance of caution. We don't want to ever become ritualistic. We don't ever want to be guilty of what Jesus called empty babbling, just repeating words that have no meaning to us. And maybe you've heard people say the Lord's Prayer in a way that was so routine that it lacked real depth and meaning. But during these eight weeks we study it, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together. Now I know the way you remember it, our Father which art in heaven... Yeah, let's don't, uh, don't start yet. So I have, <laughs> I have chosen, be, because of, uh, partly because of a conversation I had with my son, I said I'm going to be teaching on the Lord's Prayer. And he said, oh yeah, that's the part where it says forgive us and people, the way we've forgiven others. And he said, what's the first part? I, and I made a sign for Father. He said, oh yeah, our Father... Which, what does that have to do with it, he said. And then, is it something about hallowed? Dad, what does that mean? So what we're going to do is use a translation that kind of updates some of those terms, but keeps the form. Would that be okay? So what I'd like to ask you to do is to stand with me, and let's say the Lord's Prayer together. It'll be on the screens. And um, we're not going to do this like we did memory verse a couple of weeks ago. We don't need to do this loudly. We don't need to do it uh, in that fashion. But let's just read the beautiful Lord's Prayer together as a congregation. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And God, would you just bless us in this study of your model prayer. Use it to teach us how to approach your throne in the way that a child approaches a loving father. Amen. Thank you, and God bless you. Would you please be seated? Our study of the Lord's Prayer really begins in a place that might be a little bit unexpected. It's found in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Genesis 1, right at the conclusion of the account of creation, just as God is about to create Adam and Eve, the Bible says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. He created man in the image of God. He created them male and female. Now three times those two simple verses tell us that we are created in the image of God. You are made in the image of God. 
And therefore, because you're made in the image of God, you have something unique to all of God's creation. You have the spiritual capacity to pray. You have the spiritual capacity to communicate with God. That's why in the Garden of Eden, as God created Adam and Eve, He established a practice that every day He walked with Adam. Every day they spent time together. He did that because that was the habit. That was the norm. Communication with God was what was intended. You were made for conversation with God. And that's the essence of the Lord's Prayer. It is, in essence, a conversation with God. As we think about the Lord's Prayer, we want to put some uh, basic foundation stones in place. There are five of them, just, just concepts that we need to have in place, things we need to realize as we begin to study the Lord's Prayer. And the first is this, God knows all things. We call that His omniscience. Now, I know that's not a surprise to you, but I want us to think about it in terms of our prayer lives. God knows all things. He knows what's happened in the past, and He knows what's happening now in the present, and He knows what's hap- what will happen in the future. He is never surprised. Therefore, our prayers are not intended primarily to update God on what's going on in our lives. Now, we're going to learn that it is pleasing to God for us to talk to Him about what's going on in our lives, but we don't need to approach it in with the foundation that God doesn't know. God knows. God knows all things. The second foundation stone we put in place is that God has already committed himself to provide for you. God has already made promises time and time and time again to provide for you in the word of God. In Philippians chapter 4, the Bible says God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. God has committed to supply everything that you need. In Psalm 23, the beautiful 23rd Psalm, the Bible says, The Lord is my shepherd, and because the Lord is my shepherd, I will never be in want. It's a promise that God will provide for us. Psalm 34, verse 9, is filled with that same promise. For you that fear Yahweh, those of you who fear Him will lack nothing. The Lord is the great provider, and so prayer is not manipulation of God to get him to do something that he doesn't really want to do. You ever fall into that trap? Fall into the trap of thinking that, okay, my task in prayer is to convince God to provide something that God really is holding back. He really doesn't want to convince to provide this, but if I pray enough or I pray in the right way or I get the right people praying, God will do something that he really didn't intend or want to do. That's not what prayer is. The third foundation stone we put in place is that God invites us to tell him what we need. In spite of the fact that he knows everything, in spite of the fact that he's already promised to provide for us, Jesus himself said, ask, seek, knock. You see, that's an instruction from the Lord. It's a divine mandate, in fact. But this is where prayer gets intensely personal. And I don't don't want you to feel, you know, I'm going to lead a closing prayer at the end of this, and I'm already intimidated about what to not say and what to say. Uh, I don't want you to feel like you have to check off these boxes and make sure you're keeping all the rules. For example, we don't always have to say, Lord, I know you already know this, but the Lord invites us to ask and to seek and to knock. And our prayer becomes intensely personal because the Heavenly Father invites us to make our needs known to Him. In spite of all that He knows, in spite of all His intentions He's already stated, we are, by His grace, invited to make our needs known to Him. The fourth foundation stone we need to put in place is really important. And it's this, we don't really know what we need. We might know part of it, but we really don't know what we should even pray for, do we? In fact, our perspective is so limited. Uh, We are limited by our own experiences. So the things we've experienced in the past limit our ability to see what we should pray for. 
Our, our perspective is limited by our own desires. It's limited by the fact that we can't see the future and God can. Our perspective is even limited by our own selfishness and our own pride. All that gets in the way of us really understanding what we actually need. In Romans chapter 8, verse 26, the Bible tells us how God solves this problem for us. It says there that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, joins us to help in our weakness. He goes on to say, we don't know how to pray, but the Spirit intercedes. And the translation I'm using uses the term unspoken groanings. The Spirit intercedes with unspoken groanings. If you're uh, old enough to have memorized this verse in King James Version, it's with groanings that cannot be uttered. Concepts, groanings, expressions of the innermost soul that are so deep that it's impossible even to put them into words. The Holy Spirit knows exactly what we need and exactly when we need it. And the Spirit is absolutely spot on in terms of His perspective. And so the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. The fifth foundation stone I ask you to put in place is that God knows what we need before we even ask. Uh, That's what Jesus is going to say the very sentence before uh, the Lord's Prayer. He says, your your father... um, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong spot. He says, your father knows the things you need before you even ask. And notice that sentence comes immediately before Jesus said, pray like this. Your father knows what you need before you ask. Pray like this. So the fact that Jesus knows what we need before we even ask does not mean that we should not pray. I've had people actually talk to me about that. Pastor, if God knows what we need and he knows it better than I know it, then why don't I just leave it to him? I'm not even going to pray. No, immediately after Jesus said, your father knows what you need before you ask, He said, when you pray, pray like this. God doesn't need our prayers, but we need to pray. When we pray, we express our complete and total dependence on God. Think of it this way. Imagine a four-year-old child working on a puzzle. And the child has that puzzle down on the floor. And they're trying to put that puzzle together in the correct way. And so they're struggling with it. But the puzzle is just a little bit beyond the ability of the four-year-old child. And seated nearby is the dad. And the father is watching with real interest as this child struggles to piece this puzzle together. Does the father say, no, 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 step aside. Let me work that puzzle for you. Well, he could do that, and some of you may have even done that at times, but that's not best for the kid, is it? That's not what that child needs. What that father does is he waits and he watches as the child struggles with that puzzle. And then at exactly the right moment, the child says, Dad, could you help me with this? And then the the father gets down in the floor with the child and together the father and the child put that puzzle together in exactly the right way. You see, every prayer is the cry of a child saying, Father, I need your help. I can't do this without you. Our prayers are important to God in exactly the same way that a request for help from a child is important to a father. And in His grace and mercy, God has invited us to join Him in His kingdom work. And we know that God's plan is going to unfold. We know that God doesn't need us to accomplish the things that He intends to accomplish. But in His grace and in His mercy, God has chosen to use us. And he's chosen to include our prayer lives in that work. So in praying, we join him in seeing his kingdom unfold exactly according to his plan. As I studied the Lord's Prayer this week, three words kept coming up. First of all, the Lord's Prayer is simple. Do you notice when we said the Lord's Prayer together that there are no, there are no long words? There are no strange religious or theological terms And there is no repetition. Did you notice that? It is beautiful in its simplicity. The Lord's Prayer is brief. 
The Lord's Prayer is very brief. In the translation, we're using it 69 words. I think in Greek, it's probably 65 words. It's a very concise, very brief prayer. But the third word is comprehensive. The Lord's Prayer is simple, it is brief, but it is comprehensive. As Telic said, it contains it all. Everything we need to express to the Father is there. A model for every kind of praying we should do is there. Now, the Lord's Prayer is included two places in the New Testament. It's in Matthew 6, which we will study today and throughout the summer, and it is in Luke chapter 11. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1, the Bible gives us a little bit of the context of when Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Luke 11, 1, the Bible says he was praying in a certain place. And when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Get the picture? Jesus was praying. And when he finished praying, one of the disciples said, Lord, we need to know how to pray like that. Could you teach us to pray like you pray? And the Lord's response was what we know as the Lord's Prayer. Now think about what these guys have seen. These guys have seen Jesus say the words, peace be still, and a storm stopped. They've seen him teach thousands of people gathered on a hillside. They have seen him heal people who were sick. They've seen him feed people by the thousands. And yet they never, as far as we know, said, Lord, would you teach us to make a speech to thousands of people? They never said, Lord, would you show us how to empty out all the hospitals in town and heal all those people? But what they said was, Lord, would you please teach us how to pray? Now, before we study the Lord's Prayer itself, we need to study the verses immediately preceding it. So we're in Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to begin reading at verse because in verse 5 Jesus tells us some things that we should not do verses 5 through uh, 8 so in Matthew 6 verse 5 Jesus said when you pray you must not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people I assure you they've got their reward And then he said in verse 6, You, when you pray, go into a private room and shut the door and pray to your Father who's in secret. And your Father who sees in secret secret will reward you. When you pray, don't babble like the idolaters, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, because your Father knows the things you need before you ask Him. So there are three things that Jesus says, all right, Put these things in place and remember these things before you even come to the Lord's Prayer. First, in verse 5, we are to pray. Jesus said, when you pray. He didn't say, if you pray. He said, when you pray. In fact, it is unthinkable that a person could be a follower of Jesus Christ and not spend time praying. So Jesus said, when you pray, do it this way. He set the example for prayer. He was often alone in prayer. He commanded us to pray, and He invites us to pray. So when you pray, that's the first thing to remember. We are to pray. The second thing Jesus said before we jump into the Lord's Prayer next week, Jesus said, don't be like the hypocrites when you pray. Now, Jesus condemned hypocrisy at every level, didn't He? He didn't like hypocrisy at all. But Jesus was talking about a very specific event that took place, a very common thing that these folks had seen just about every week of their lives. These folks had been walking down the street, and they had seen some guy dressed in fancy religious robes. And sometimes they would even march through the streets with a drum beating or a musical instrument sounding to call attention to themselves. And then they would stand on the street corner in great public display and utter their poetic, beautiful, well-worded prayers. And the same thing would happen in the synagogue, which was their place of studying the Word. So Jesus said something about their motives. He said they only do that to be seen by people. And by the way, they have their reward. They're going to be seen by people, and that's all the reward that they're going to get. 
Now, uh, we have to ask the painful question, are we tempted to, to, to do that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, I, I am so intimidated about the public prayers I'm going to pray <laughs> during, this, during this summer, you know, because I don't want to step into that. I, you, you know what I mean. I'm not really intimidated to pray, but, you know, it, it, is, it is something that we need to pause and think about. Now, Jesus is going to say in the next verse, and we already read it, Jesus says in verse 6, when you pray, do it in private. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But there is a place for public prayer. The example is set in Scripture, and the command is given to pray in public in Scripture, and that's a good thing to do. That's an okay thing to do. Jesus is getting at the motive. He's saying if the motive is to be seen by people, then you're going to be seen by people, and that's all the reward that you're going to get. This is something more. He said, when you pray, I want you to go beyond the outward appearance. I want you to have a heart for God, not just the outward appearance of a heart for God. Jesus is saying, I want you to direct your prayers toward the Lord. And so he said, when you pray, go in a private room and close the door. Now, that's a good thing. If you have a private room and you close the door, that's a good thing to do. But I don't think the instruction is as much about architecture as it is about the condition of our hearts. But the Lord said there is a time in your life, Christian, when you need to get alone to pray. There's a time in your life, there needs to be moments in your life when you pray alone. That's an important piece of your prayer life. Why? Well, you see, when you get alone to pray, there's almost no temptation to pray as a show. There's certainly not a temptation to pray as a show for other people. I say almost because it is possible that you could be just trying to impress yourself. That, that's a little bit subjective, isn't it? But yeah, I think sometimes we could go that far. But when you're praying alone, the Lord is saying, hey, there's no temptation for you to put on a show there. When you're alone, you're just going to talk to your Father. You're going to communicate with your Father. Now, Jesus set the example of praying alone. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, the Bible says, After dismissing the crowd, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray, and when evening came, he was there alone. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up, went out, and made his way to a deserted place, and he was praying there. In Luke chapter 5, Verse 15, but the news about him spread even more. This one grabbed my attention. The news about Jesus spread even more. Large crowds would come together to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. Yet, even though large crowds were demanding his attention all the time, yet he often withdrew to deserted places and prayed. We live in a busy world with a hectic pace. Everything grabs for our attention and our time and our energy. We live in a society in which even resting is a suspect. You're thought to be lazy if you take a day off. That's a trick by Satan himself. The fact is you were designed, you were made to spend time alone with God. And that's the instruction of Jesus himself. Go into a place where you can be alone with God and spend time with your heavenly Father. So the second thing he says to remember is don't pray like the hypocrites. The third thing he says to remember is don't pray to impress others. Don't pray to impress those around you. And in 7 and 8, verses 7 and 8, don't pray to impress God. Don't make impressing God your goal. So he mentions the vain babblers, empty babblers. It's people repeating empty phrases, reciting things that have years ago lost their meaning for people. Things that are just memorized phrases. And Jesus said about them, they imagine, get that key word, they imagine that God will hear them because of their many words. And so Jesus is teaching us that nothing could be further 
from the truth. How do you view God when you're praying? Is He distant with arms crossed, waiting for you to get this prayer thing right? No, not at all. That's a trick that Satan uses to keep you from spending time with your heavenly Father. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus himself said it this way. He said, look, behold, take a look at this. Notice this. I am standing at the door and knocking. If you will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we'll share a meal together. You see what Jesus is saying? He's saying, I want to spend time with you. I want to be a part of your life. I want to hear from you, and I want you to hear from me. I want to say some things, and you hear me, and I want you to say some things, and me hear you. I'm standing at the door and knocking. If you'll just hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. That's what Jesus wants for you and your relationship with Him. Prayer is not reserved for those who use big words and strong emotions and repeat things over and over. Prayer is a simple, heartfelt conversation between God and His child. Have you read Corey Ten Boom's autobiography? It's called The Hiding Place. And in that book, she tells about her home in Holland where her father and her family uh, provided a safe place for Jews who were being hunted by the Nazis. And so they made this attic space into a hiding place. Before long, they were discovered. And Tin Boom's entire family was sent to Ravensbrück, Ravensbrück for the, to the concentration camp. Uh, Dad died, we think, pretty early in that process. But uh, Corey and her sister Betsy went into a dormitory where they would live in Ravensbrook. She said, as she wrote about it, that the, the, the first step into that dormitory took her breath away. It was the scent of raw sewage and soiled bedding, but that wasn't the worst of it. As they got deeper into that huge building, she discovered that there were fleas everywhere. And so Corey Ten Boom cried out to her sister, Betsy. She said, this is more than I can bear. How can we live in such a place? And Betsy said, show us. Show us how. Corey Ten Boom wrote about that, and she said, it took me a long time to realize that she was praying she said it so matter-of-factly that it took me a while to realize that my sister was praying. More and more, the distinction between prayer and the rest of her life seemed to be vanishing for Betsy. I love that description. The distinction between prayer and the rest of her life seemed to be vanishing. That's what I want for me. That is my prayer for us as a congregation. And I think it's the heart of God's desire for us in this model prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer. The so what of this message is pretty simple. Where else, what else could it be? Get alone with God. Maybe it's today, maybe it's later this week. Find a place and find a time and get alone with God and accept His conversation to have a spiritual conversation. Accept His invitation to have a spiritual conversation with Him. It'll be a precious moment. I realize that for some of you, you may not quite be ready for that conversation. If there's never been a time when you've established a relationship with God through Jesus Christ... I would ask you to do that today. Today could be that moment when you say, Jesus, I know that I've sinned and I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I want you spiritually just to enter into me and to begin to live in me. I want your Holy Spirit to enter me and begin to live in me. And Lord, I give you control of my life. I am willing for you to call the shots. I'm willing to call you Lord in my life and live my life for you.
If you've not taken that initial step, I ask you to do that today. Come and see me or go to the prayer wall and let the folks there lead you through a process, a little simple, heartfelt prayer that you can pray, inviting Jesus into your heart. But most of you have done that, and if you have done that, I would invite you today to just make a commitment. This week, I'm going to get alone with God and spend some time with Him. Let's pray.